Well, when you hear the word king, what image comes to your mind? Do you think of someone powerful? Do you think of someone with great royal wealth? Perhaps someone wearing a golden crown with jewels in it, surrounded by loyal subjects, the leader of the government, the commander of the military? Is that what comes to mind when you hear the word king? Or does an itinerant preacher with no home of his own riding on a borrowed donkey, does that come to your mind? Well, today we're going to be looking at a very familiar passage of Scripture. After all, today is Palm Sunday. Next Sunday is Easter Sunday. Today we feel the gravity and the gloom of the activities of the coming week, the heaviness of what the Son of God went through on our behalf. But we know that Easter is coming. On this side of the cross, on this side of the resurrection, we know that Easter is coming. Easter has already come. It's a fact. So I I want us all to resist the temptation of becoming complacent with what we're so familiar with. And I would ask that you enter into anew, afresh, this story that you've heard so many times before and approach it with new receptive hearts. Let's pray together as we begin. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you today asking to receive from your word what only you can give us. Lord, I pray that you would take your word and apply it directly to our hearts. Lord, we claim the promise that your word will not return unto you void, but it will accomplish everything that you set out for it to accomplish. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me give you a little bit of context before we get into the actual scripture. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. He was traveling from Jericho in Luke chapter 19. He had been at the home of Zacchaeus, uh, a very rich and very notorious tax collector. And while Jesus was at this home, making his way to Jerusalem, knowing that the cross awaited him, mockery awaited him, he took time to tell a parable. And the parable that Jesus told was about a nobleman, a leader that was going into a, a foreign country to receive his own kingdom. And before he left, he, gave, he called ten of his, his subjects together and he gave them each a mina. Now, a mina was the equivalent of about three months' wages, and he gave each one of his loyal subjects one mina and told them to do business with this, invest this, show a return because I'm coming back. And so you know the story. One of the servants took the mina and he invested and came up with ten minas and he was rewarded. One invested his mina and, was re- and came up with five minas and was rewarded. One servant hid his mina, wrapped it up in a, in a handkerchief and buried it, hid it. He said, Lord, I, kn- I knew you were a severe man, and so I knew you harvested where you didn't plant, and so I wanted to be very careful with what you gave me, so I did nothing with it. Here it is. And Jesus said that the nobleman who was returning as king condemned this servant. And so it was very clear from Jesus telling this story that Jesus was equating this nobleman's kingdom with his own coming kingdom. It was clear that Jesus wanted his disciples and his followers to understand that his kingdom was not an immediate kingdom. His kingdom was not going to immediately overthrow the Roman regime. 
His kingdom was a delayed kingdom, and it would be delayed by his own crucifixion, his own burial, his own resurrection, his great commission, his ascension into heaven, and delayed until his present, until his second coming, which is presently where we find ourselves today, waiting patiently on the king to return. And this was Jesus' point. Now, having made that point, Jesus did something very interesting, very curious. I, in fact, I find it fascinating. Having said that his kingdom is a delayed kingdom, a coming kingdom, not an immediate kingdom, Jesus makes a very public statement. Usually, Jesus would deflect attention away from himself, but not in, not in this instance. Jesus did something that drew attention to himself. I, I love what R. Kent Hughes, the commentator, said. He said, never before had Jesus done anything to promote a public demonstration. In fact, he had repeatedly withdrawn from crowds if there was any hint of such a thing. And if you're familiar with Scripture, Jesus did this on a number of occasions. When he confirmed his true identity with his disciples, what did Jesus say? He said, don't tell anyone yet. Keep this to yourself. Keep this secret. When he healed a man with leprosy, Jesus did the same thing. He said, don't go telling everyone what I've done. Instead, go show yourself to the priest to authenticate your healing. The man healed of his leprosy didn't follow Jesus' instructions too well. And then on other occasions when Jesus cast out demons, he did the same thing. He warned the demons, do not say, do not speak, don't say who I am. But now what does Jesus do? He sends his disciples, two of his disciples, into town to round up a donkey so that he can ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. Don't don't miss the significance of this. This is very significant. We'll begin our reading in Luke chapter 19, verse 32. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. Jesus had told the the two disciples that you'll go into town and you will find a donkey that's never been ridden. He'll be tied. Untie it and bring it back to me. And if someone says something, tell them that the Lord has need of this donkey. And as they were untying the colt in verse 33... Its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Jesus and his disciples traveling from Jericho, about to enter Jerusalem, going through Bethany and Bethpage on a donkey, You know, the Mount of Olives is directly across from the city of Jerusalem. I want to show you a couple of, a few pictures. The first picture is a view from the Mount of Olives looking over at the city of Jerusalem. You can see the wall of the city in between the Mount of Olives and the city of Jerusalem is the Kidron Valley. So the next picture I want you to see is a close-up of the eastern gate 
which is the most likely path that Jesus and his followers on Palm Sunday took to enter into the city. Um, you, you know, you can't go to Israel, you can't visit the Holy Land without being struck by a number of, of things. One of the things that I was struck with was the peacefulness of the Mount of Olives. Here's a picture that shows just the greenery and the peacefulness. You can see the slope. I mean, it is, the Mount of Olives is a mount. Peaceful. Those are olive trees. But there's also something that if you, if you see what's, what the Mount of Olives looks like today, you can't help but be struck by this next picture. This is the Mount of Olives. Not a lot of greenery, is it? All of these are tombs. Tombs covering the Mount of Olives. If you were to look a little bit to the left, you would see more greenery. You would see where I took the picture that you just saw of, of the olive trees in the garden. The point that this picture makes is that there is a terrible cloud of gloom that hangs over the entire earth. Isaiah 25, 7 says, there's a cloud of gloom, the shadow of death that hangs over the entire world. Jesus was traveling down the Mount of Olives, which today looks so racked with death. He was traveling down the Mount of Olives to himself die so that we might have eternal life. It was very clear to everyone in Jesus' day that when kings came to town riding a donkey, they were coming in peace. When a conquering king came in war times, he, he, rode, a war, he rode in on a war horse, a mighty steed. Jesus' statement was very clear. And the disciples, the followers, the, the crowd, the multitude that were casting their cloaks on the road, the disciples cried, Behold the King. Behold the King. Surely this was the moment. Surely this was the time in Jesus' ministry. He had already done great miracles. He had already authenticated who he was. Surely this was the moment that everyone had been waiting for. Surely this was the moment when the kingdom would be established and the Messiah would begin to reign on earth. The crowd cries, blessed is the king. The king brings peace, glory in the highest. This harkens back to the birth of Jesus when the angel said, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those who have found favor with him. Of course, there were always Pharisees and religious leaders lurking in the background of Jesus' ministry, waiting, just hoping to catch Jesus healing someone on the Sabbath or doing something that they could disagree with, looking constantly for a reason to arrest him. So there is Jesus. Blessed is the king. The Pharisees in verse 39 said, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Teacher, rebuke your disciples. What Jesus was doing was absolutely scandalous. And they knew it. He was claiming to be the Messiah. He was claiming to be the Holy One of God. And they saw it in the way he was riding the donkey, the colt, into town. They saw it in the way that everyone was quoting. They were quoting a, a, a passage of Scripture in Zechariah, Zechariah 9, verse 9, which says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he. Riding, mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 
prophecy was being fulfilled. And the Pharisees didn't recognize it. Everyone else there did recognize it. Hosanna to the king. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The king is coming. He's humble. He's righteous. And he's bringing salvation. Should Jesus reign his disciples in? Should Jesus call them back and say, not so much excitement, let's just ride into town. I appreciate the acknowledgement, but let's not make too big of a fuss of this. Should Jesus have done that? Would that have been the right thing to do? That's what the religious leaders told him to do. Have you no shame? Stop your disciples. Stop your followers, teacher. Listen to what Jesus said in verse 40. Jesus said, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Now, how's that for an answer? How's that? I mean, he's making a bold statement coming down the Mount of Olives on a donkey. The king coming in peace, bringing salvation. He's not going to rein his followers in. He's not going to tone down the praise because if he did, the very stones would cry out in praise. Now, I don't know how much you know about rocks. When I was growing up, I was fascinated with rocks. I used to collect rocks. I would find mica rocks, and, 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 and it looked very valuable. And I thought, well, I'm going to be rich from these rocks. Those rocks never made me rich. Some of you might remember back in the 1970s a phenomenon called pet rocks. Anybody ever had a pet rock? Easy to take care of, weren't they? Just leave a little bit of food on the table where they were sitting, and you could go away for thousands of years. <laughs> a pet rock could do nothing because it was a rock. The only thing it could do, if you dropped it on your mother's coffee table, rocks can't do anything. They can't praise but here's what we know. Creation cries, worship the king. Creation cries, worship the king. Listen to this call of worship in Psalm 148. Creation is supposed to praise the Lord. Creation is supposed to praise the king. Verse 1 of Psalm 148, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him all his angels, all his hosts. Praise him, listen to this, sun and moon and stars. Praise him, you highest heavens, you waters above the heavens. And, and, and the reason for praising the Lord of creation is he created you. He created you. Praise the Lord, you great sea creatures. Fire, hail, snow, mist, stormy wind. Mountains, hills, fruit trees, all cedars, praise the Creator. Beasts and livestock, creeping things, and flying birds. Worship is the only response to God, the Creator. I, I, I love, on Tuesdays, we've been doing a lunchtime Bible study at Oasis. We've been in the book of Revelation, and we're going to be in the book of Revelation until we finish. We just, over the past two weeks, finished chapters 4 and 5. And what we see in chapters 4 and 5 is the Apostle John brought up into heaven, and what he witnesses right before the question is asked, who is worthy to take the scroll and break the seals and open it and read it, right before that happens, there's worship going on. There's worship, and there's two reasons for this worship. One is creation. All of heaven is worshiping because of creation itself. And the other reason is redemption. 
Listen to these words from Revelation 4.11. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Creation is a reason to worship and praise God. And then in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, redemption, and they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Reasons to worship, creation, and redemption, and Jesus in the story is riding down the Mount of Olives to accomplish that redemption. Verse 41, as we continue reading in Luke 19, and when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. The king, the king that's coming in peace, looks at the city of Jerusalem, the view that we saw a few minutes ago, and he weeps. Now, the kind of weeping that Jesus did is not the kind of weeping that he did at the tomb of Lazarus. See, at the tomb of Lazarus, we know that Jesus wept because John 11, verse 35, is the shortest verse of the Bible, one of the first ones that many of us memorized, and we still have it memorized to this day. Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus, but the word that's used there for weep is the, is the Greek word dekruo. Now, dekruo means to weep, to shed tears, to be sorrowful, but this type of weeping is the kind of weeping that you can do and maintain your dignity. This kind of weeping is not the kind of weeping that Jesus was engaged in as he rode down the Mount of Olives. The word that's used there is a, is a more familiar word for weeping. It's the Greek word klyo. Now, you don't need to know that for the test, but what you do need to know is that it's a different kind of weeping. It's the kind of weeping that you could call lamenting at the death of someone close. Not weeping, keeping your composure, but weeping, losing it, sobbing uncontrollably. That is the kind of weeping that Jesus was doing as he traveled down the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem knowing full well what awaited him. A weeping king? Listen to what Jesus said. He was devastated. He was devastated at how badly the Jewish people were getting it wrong. Verse 42 of Luke 19, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. King Jesus is saying, don't overlook your king. He's crying, don't overlook your king. And he continues on in verse 43, for the days will come to you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. Jesus is painting a dismal picture for the future of the people of Israel, the people of Jerusalem. And they will not leave, listen to this, they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. King Jesus is devastated. King Jesus is grieved. And he's grieved over several things. First of all, he's grieved over meaningless religious activity. He had seen that over and over and over among the religious elite, the high priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, meaningless 
religious activity. You know, even in our day, there are people that get caught up in meaningless religious activity. You know, it's possible to do all of the right things for all of the right reasons and for it just to become kind of automatic. Our efforts at righteousness are meaningless. We cannot contribute one thing to our righteousness. There are none righteous, no, not one. Scripture tells us that. The Pharisees thought that they could be righteous by keeping the law. There were enough laws, and, the, and if they didn't have enough laws, they were fully capable of coming up with hundreds of other laws to clarify the laws. So that when the disciples took some grain one day and broke it open and ate a little bit of grain, they said, they're harvesting. They weren't harvesting. Meaningless religious activity. Another thing that Jesus was grieved over was the fact that they totally misunderstood peace. Totally misunderstood peace. The things that make for peace, you're blind to that. I love what the NASB says in verse 42. It says, if you had known the day, if you had known this day, the conditions for peace. You see, there are certain conditions for peace. Peace doesn't just happen in a fallen world. There are conditions that have to be met. The NLT version in, in verse 42 says, How I wish that you of all people would understand the way to peace. But they didn't. They didn't understand the things that made for peace. They didn't understand the conditions for peace. And they certainly did not understand the way to peace. Here's the thing. Peace is available. Everyone searches for peace. And peace is not just the cessation of hostilities. No, because you can have no outward hostilities at all and still have no peace. The peace that Jesus brings is a peace like none other. I remember years ago, some of you may remember this pop singer, some of you may not. Um, if you don't remember, then that's a blessing. But I was subjected to some of her music. The pop singer was Alanis Morissette. She was a melancholy pop singer back in the 1990s and two, early 2000s. And she, all of, none of her songs were happy. I mean, they went from gloomy to gloomier. Her favorite quote of mine is this. She, was, she, was, she said one time, peace of mind. Peace of mind for five minutes. That's what I crave. Peace of mind for five minutes. That's what I crave. That's what the whole world craves. And that's what the king, Jesus, was traveling down the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem to deliver. Peace. His peace. The peace that he delivers is a special kind of peace. It's a vertical peace, a peace that begins with being right with God. And that peace flows out horizontally to all mankind. Vertical peace, horizontal peace. This peace is like nothing else. You know, the world searches for peace. We search for peace. Our society searches for peace in all the wrong places. We search for peace in alcohol, in drugs, in relationships, in sex, money, achievements, power, entertainment, fun, looking for peace, looking for that five minutes of escape. Jesus is bringing peace that eliminates any affirmation from any of these false sources of peace. Jesus was grieved because of Jerusalem's blindness to the coming destruction. 
what Jesus was predicting was actually going to happen in A.D. 70. And he knew it. He saw it. He saw the destruction coming. And he said that the destruction will be so great because you didn't recognize when the Prince of Peace was here. You didn't know that the day of your visitation was today. The destruction that came in A.D. 70 was so complete. Listen to what Jewish historian Josephus said. All hope of escaping was now cut off from the Jews. Together with their liberty of going out of the city, then did the famine widen its progress and devour the people by whole houses and families. Jesus saw this coming, a rebellious and unrepentant people. Josephus continues, the upper rooms of women and infants were dying by famine. And the lanes of the city were full of dead bodies of the aged. The children also and the young men wandered about in the marketplaces like shadows, all swelled with famine, and fell down dead wheresoever their misery seized them. For a time the dead were buried, but afterwards, when they could not do that, they had them cast down from the wall into the valleys beneath. Do you understand the reasons for the tears of King Jesus? The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, the Prince of Peace, the Savior of the world. I think it only fitting that we end our service today with the observance of the Lord's Supper. And I would like to ask the deacons if they would to come forward at this time and take your places. But before we go get the elements, I want us to enter into a time of reflection because the Lord's Supper is a very special, a very special and a very holy time. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, we know the purpose of this is to announce the Lord's death until he returns, but we're also given a warning in verse 28, let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. So this time of eating the bread and drinking the cup is a time of reflection. And this is open for all believers, any denomination, that have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. Join with me as we reflect and as you come take the elements. For all have sinned fall short of the glory of God. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was wounded for our transgressions. 
He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Lord Jesus, fully mindful of what was about to happen as he celebrated the Passover with his disciples in the upper room in Jerusalem. He said on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks for it, he broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament, the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We want to end today with a time of decision. I'm going to be up front along with some members of our response team If the Lord has placed something on your heart, maybe you weren't able to participate in the Lord's Supper with a full conscience. Maybe you need to accept Christ as your personal Savior. What better time than today? Maybe you need prayer. We would love to pray with you. Maybe the Lord is moving in your heart to join the church. Whatever that is, now is the time to do that. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, Thank you for this time together. Lord, I pray that you would give each of us the courage to respond in whatever way that the Holy Spirit is moving us. In Jesus' name, amen.